I'm John Stewart. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Population Health Sciences of the School of Public Health here at Georgia State University. Uh, and it's going to be my honor to introduce our uh, guest speaker today, Dr. David Dijak. Uh, but just for a moment, I wanted to reflect on some advice that my boss gave me back when I was at the very beginning of my career. And he told me that it was imperative for my career to do two things. Number one, he said, eventually you need to go back and get your master's degree in public health. And I managed to accomplish that within a few years of starting my career. And the second thing he said is, you must join the National Environmental Health Association. Yeah. And so I took his advice, and it's been uh, very rewarding to me to be a member uh, of NEHA for uh, well over 40 years now. And I continue to feel that every time I have to write that check for dues, it's a, it's a great investment on uh, uh, my career to support this national organization that, that supports all of us in environmental health and the uh, people of the world uh, whose lives are made better by environmental health. So enough of that. And let me get to uh, the introduction of our speaker. Uh, Dr. David Dijak is the executive director and CEO of the National Environmental Health Association, a position that he's held since uh, 2015. Uh, David, I'm sure, will tell you just a little bit about me, huh? so I won't do that. Dr. Dijak has a doctorate uh, in public health from the University of Michigan, go blue, <laughs> and an MSPH from the University of Utah. He's also a certified industrial hygienist, which is one of the many specializations that fall under this broad category of environmental health. Um, now more recent work, Dr. Dijak is the principal investigator on two projects that are funded by the Centers for Disease Control currently. The first is a grant to increase the capacity of the uh, National Environmental Health Workforce here in the US, and the second is on rebuilding the environmental health uh, workforce and services program in the U.S. Virgin Islands and in Puerto Rico. He's an internationally recognized authority on environmental health, including the environmental health workforce. And he's recently returned from Kampala, Uganda, where he was uh, a speaker at an international conference on environmental health. So I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about a global perspective on environmental health, as well as what's going on here in the US. So uh, David, we're so glad you could come today, and welcome to Georgia State. Uh, thanks, John. <laughs> so for the folks that came in late, it is not rude to get up and get pizza or a drink. Uh, please help yourself. I'm naturally animated, and I understand that there's a camera right here on this spot, so I, I need to remain, oh, I can do this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm somewhat animated as a speaker, uh, so if I get off camera too much, just kind of point to me, and uh, hopefully it'll all be good. We'll take questions at the end, if that's okay with you, and uh, Dr. Stewart, if you would let me know if I kind of babble on too long, give me like 10 minutes, I can be sure to uh, okay. I will do that. Uh, to, to be sure to get some time for, for questions and, and answers. It was about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I arrived jet lag to Heathrow T2. Anyone here have been to, to London and flown into to Heathrow? It's, it's a monstrosity of an airport. And you guys that have been there, and you ladies that have been there, you know what immigration is like. I think I waited there for an hour just to get checked in to the country. Once I succeeded with that, I went down and got my Oyster card. For those of you that take the, the tube, I got my Oyster card recharged. I got like a four-day pass, jumped on the tube, and found myself at Waterloo Station. Uh, I was going to speak to the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. And they are the NEHA of the UK. 
And with Brexit, this is going to be really interesting to see how all that food safety and all those regulations, uh, uh, changes in those affect them. But I, I came up the steps. If any of you have ever been to, to what the Waterloo Station, it's just off the Jubilee Line, or I think there's like three lines that, that go through, through Waterloo. And I got to the top of the steps, and I got out into the fresh air, and I had a memory came back to me. It was a story told to me about Robert and Alice Polycott. Uh, Robert and Alice owned a store, a grocery store, during World War II, which was just a few blocks from, from Waterloo Station. And during the war, as you know, the Germans used to, to bomb London with some frequency. And they had two young children, Happy and Cynthia. And, and the question was, during World War II, if you lived in London, what do you do with your children? They were an important part of their community. In fact, I would like to suggest that Robert and Alice Polycock were one of the first retail food outlets that actually had a hotline. They used to serve hot lunches. They used to make sandwiches, just like you see at Whole Foods, right? And almost every grocery store now, I don't know if the public does, but almost every grocery store now has a hotline. So for those of you interested in retail food safety, right, what do we call those? Grocerants, right? Because you can go in and it's almost like a little uh, restaurant as well as a place where you can buy your, your groceries for the day. And so they were very focused on being an essential part of their community, but yet they had these two young girls. And it was a classic case of, do you take the red pill or the blue pill? And if you look at the, uh, the, the prior slide, who is that? It's Morpheus, right? And he's talking to Nemo in the Matrix. And he's like, if you take the blue pill, you go home and go to bed, and you wake up the next day and nothing has changed. It's the same old crap, just a different day in, in your life. But if you take the red pill, then you're exposed to the matrix. You go down a rabbit hole and you can see all the potential of the matrix all around you. And each and every day, we are presented with the red pill or the blue pill moment. Right? In your own life, you have, do I move to California to start a career there, or do I stay here in Atlanta, a place that I've always known and I'm very comfortable with, the red pill or the blue pill? So Robert and Alice had a red pill and blue pill moment. And in a little bit, I'll share with you what, what their decisions were about that binary decision, <coughs> yes or no, what do I do with my kids, do I send them some other place, or do I keep them home with me? where I know that they'll, where they'll be safe. I believe in environmental health, and I could even make the case public health. We are at an inflection point in the evolution of the country. I'm going to make the case over the next 30 to 45 minutes that we're at a red pill, blue pill moment in the practice of our professions, and the profession that many of you have selected to spend your professional time. I'll describe what I see, and this is just from my perspective, what I consider the three great areas of environmental health. I'll then get into some of uh, what I consider the new normal, and I'll finish up with recommendations for all practitioners, whether you're a student emerging in your career, whether you're mid-career, or for some of the folks in the back row, they are senior professionals within departments of public health at the local or at the state level. And again, I'm normally quite animated, so this is tough for me, but I'm going to try and stay in the, in, in, in the camera. And the camera uh, catch it all the way to the clock. All, okay. You yeah. get all the stage. Cool. Exactly. Thanks. So I would like to suggest to you that the first great era of environmental health started not far from here. In fact, on Sunday of this week, I was go driving through the battlefields of the Civil War in Virginia. And we stopped at a few antique stores and saw the bullets that were from that era that, that were being sold. But the reason I talk about era one of environmental health in this country really has its roots back to the Civil War and, frankly, the war before it, which was what? The Mexican-American War. Do you know that in the Mexican-American War, seven Soldiers died from unsanitary conditions for every one that died on the battlefield. Seven to one. 
and it was an inspired Abraham Lincoln who created a sanitary commission during the Civil War that improved the sanitary conditions of the camps in the Civil War so that that loss of life went from seven to one to three to one. It's still awful. Three people died of unsanitary conditions for every one that died on the battlefield during the Civil War. And it was a great improvement over, over seven, seven to one. And as you can see behind me, uh, those were some of those conditions that we saw uh, during the Civil War uh, throughout the country. The second great era, in my estimation, is the regulatory era. And frankly, it probably started with Upton Sinclair in the jungle. when He talked about uh, the meatpacking industry and some of the conditions that were unsanitary conditions associated uh, with meat. It was an inspired Republican, ladies and gentlemen, it was a Republican that inspired the 1906 Food and Drug Act that was intended to protect the, the dining public and the consuming public from unsanitary food. And it was his uh, nephew in 1936 that signed an updated version of that act, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act in 1936. That was FDR. So it was Teddy Roosevelt in 1906. It was his nephew, FDR in 1936, who signed the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, which then included medical devices under that, that legislation. And I would consider that really the, the early era, or the early part of that second era of, of standards and rulemaking. Now, this is the stuff most of you are familiar with, the classes that you've taken or the classes that you teach. This is more the modern era around the regulatory standards framework where we have uh, the rules also generated under a Republican president, Richard Nixon. A lot of people love to hate Nixon, but for the record, he had a very progressive uh, agenda. The US EPA was created under Nixon by executive order, which most people don't talk about very much. Uh, Tosca, RICRA, OSHA, NIOSH, and I'm not going to get, I could spend a lot of time talking about those as a certified industrial hygienist. My natural partner uh, in public health work is NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. All of that was created more recently uh, under, under Richard Nixon. And that is the regulatory framework under which a lot of us do our work day to day in environmental health or in environmental public health. And I would like to say for the record that environmental health is frankly the umbrella under which public health exists. Now for some of you, you might be, wait a second now, isn't environmental health part of public health? Uh, I think it's the other way around, frankly. Where did local health departments start, by the way? They started as a blossom that came out of that Civil War era initiative. The National Sanitary Commission gave rise to local health departments, and the National Sanitary Commission was created, by and large, as the brainchild of environmental health professionals. They called them sanitarians then. And in fact, the American Public Health Association, which many of you may be members, was created by who? Sanitarians. And if Georges Benjamin, the executive director of APHA, was here today, he would tell you the same thing. So in fact, much of what we know as public health in the United States was created by environmental health professionals. And in fact, <coughs> the second largest part of the public health workforce today is what? Come on, folks. It's environmental health professionals. The single largest component of the workforce is nurses, public health nurses. The second largest part of the professional workforce is environmental health professionals. So when people talk about, oh, public health is going to do this and public health is going to do that, who is that that they're talking about? My daughter is a public health nurse. I love my daughter, but she never makes it out of the clinic. Environmental health professionals are in the community every day. They're working with the regulated community. They work in daycares and hospitals and schools. They know where Zika risk exists, where pooled water is in neighborhoods. 
And it is environmental health professionals that are the backbone of public health today. Now, you may say, oh, David's just saying this at Georgia State University. For the record, I say this in front of audiences of thousands, including federally elected officials. Environmental health is public health. And public health is a part of environmental health on, on most days. The environment is now turning on us. All you need to do is flip on CNN or Fox News and look at the coronavirus, for example. That is a zoonotic disease created by the wildlife markets which exist in China. This is about environmental health. How many environmental health professionals have you seen on the news or standing on the stage with the CDC director in Washington, D.C.? None. And this is something that we need to fix. And this is what uh, NEHA as an association is, is aiming to fix. The wildfires in California in 2018 damaged 22,000 homes. Almost 100 people perished and caused like $3.5 billion worth of damage to the state. It is unbelievable that that occurred in California just two years ago. If you look at the hurricanes, uh, and you heard during my introduction some of the damage in rebuilding the workforce that we're engaged in in Puerto Rico uh, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, this, is, this is significant. You've got major typhoons and hurricanes all throughout the world. The world is changing really, really quickly. And for those of us that are learning an environmental health profession, you need to change with it. What your professors are teaching you today is fantastic, but remember the profession is evergreen. I go to conferences, I go to trainings, I go to schools to learn about emerging science and practice on a regular basis. I'm 60 years old and I'm fully engaged in learning because it's necessary to remain relevant. The profession that you're entering or are in, you need to be committed to keeping your brain cells sharp from this day forward. Not that you weren't committed before, but I'm just reaffirming what your professors have told you. This is a profession of lifelong learning, and you need to embrace that. The world is changing in really nasty and mean-spirited ways. On the left-hand side of the slide, what you'll see is no swimming, no fishing. Where did that sign come from? Did it come from Botswana? Did it come from uh, Jamaica? Did it come from the UK? It came from the shores of uh, the Gulf of Mexico and Mississippi. This last summer, most of the state beaches were closed because of harmful algorithms. It was a public health menace. And for those of you that say, oh, public health uh, has nothing to do with the economy, go talk to the Chinese about the stock market and zoonotic diseases and how that's affected it. Anyone here from Mississippi? You know how this has affected their economy last summer when people that traditionally had gone to Biloxi to go spend time at the beach has now been compromised. How about this big blob that's off the coast of Sarasota, which has been showing up with great regularity uh, here over the last couple of years, has profoundly affected the local economy there in the southern part of the state. This is not just capricious conversation. This is dollars and cents, and this is environmental health. And this is part of our challenge moving forward. That middle photo, I took myself. What, what is that stuff? Anybody here have a guess? I took that photo about an hour drive south of Cancun on the Yucatan. I couldn't believe it. This was less than a year ago. Actually, this was in June, so it's a lot less than a year ago. Seaweed. Where is it coming from? Sargasso weed from the Sargasso Sea. What we think is the excess nutrients coming out of Brazil, out of the Amazon basin, being discharged to, to uh, the marine environment, is giving rise to excess nutrients, giving rise to additional sargasso weed uh, or extensive sargasso weed uh, blooms. They become untethered and then wash ashore in places like Cancun. They are losing billions, the Mexican government is losing billions of dollars a year in lost uh, hospitality revenue because people are like, hey, I don't want to go there. I couldn't even swim, there was that much seaweed there. And it's not just Mexico. The U.S. Virgin Islands and other U.S. territories are being affected as well. 
This is not an abstract conversation, folks. This is real, and it's happening as we now speak. For a lot of us, we say, oh, I want to go work for government, like our colleagues in the back row. I want to work. I, listen, I, I don't ever want to be sued. I don't want to be CEO like you, Dave, of, of UHA, because I don't want the liability. Well, wake up. Wake up. On the left-hand side of the slide is a, is a CEO of a private organization that got jail time for what? Salmonella and peanut butter. That's an extensive criminal sentence because of that. And it's, it's, it is, this is something new in my lifetime, that someone would go to jail for foodborne uh, illness, or creating and allowing the conditions, or knowingly creating the conditions under which someone would get salmonella. And here on the right-hand side of the slide relates to the health official, the state health official from the state of Michigan that was indicted for involuntary manslaughter around Legionella. And this is the most interesting story, folks. So I, I'm at the airport where I spend a lot of time on uh, Saturday, and my phone rings. I was actually on vacation. And it was a number from Washington, D.C. Would you have answered it? You're on vacation. It's a 202 area code. <laughs> Look at me now. You don't have to raise your hand. Are you going to answer the phone? And I'm thinking to myself, here's my wife. She's like, put the work away. Right? You don't. I, where does your attention, where is your loyalty? Is it to me or to your job? It's a 202 code. <laughs> So I picked up the phone and I answered it. And it was a group that represents people like, like that gentleman. And they had a letter of support that they wanted Neha to sign that objected to the treatment that he was receiving around Legionella. What would you have done? Listen, you could be me this time next year. What would you have done? Would you have signed on to the letter supporting that state health official? No. And you guys are giving me some blank stares. No? no. So I got to play nice in the sandbox with other associations. You know these associations. APHA, APHL, NATO, ASCO. You know them. You learn about them in class. Some of you are on their committees. What would you have done? So I asked a question of the person who asked me to either write a letter or sign on to their letter. And my, my question to them was this. Can you name me the environmental health professional that gave that state health official that advice, that that state health official followed, that led to the outcome of the Flint, Michigan Legionella case? This wasn't led. This was the Legionella case in Flint. And there was a silence in the room that moment over the telephone. And the person responded to me and said, I'll have to get back to you on that. Like, if, in fact, this, this person was receiving advice from the EH professionals, then I will sign that letter. And I'm still waiting for that return phone call. Right? Of course. So we need to be in the room. We need to be at the table when decisions around environmental exposures are being considered. For those of you that listen, lead exposure was awful in Flint. But the Legionella was, was entirely manageable, and it was not managed very well. And of course, different people have different opinions of that. But my point is this. When decisions are being made about environmental health, we should be there, and that's what Neha is an association has been working on. In this new era of environmental and public health, one of the things we need to be paying attention to, including in Atlanta, Georgia, is water. The average water line that services this building, its toilets, its sinks, its faucets, are 45 years old. There are 1.6 million miles of water pipes in this country. We lose 1 trillion gallons of water a year from leaks in those pipes and, and your faucets at home and my faucets at home. 
a lot of this plumbing is 100 years old. And much of this plumbing has what's referred to as biofilm. It's, it's that slime that's, that lines the inside of the pipes. And as we pull up these pipes, for example, lead service line replacement, we pull up pipes simply to, to replumb, we disturb some of that biofilm. Have you learned about biofilm in the management of lead uh, or pipe replacements in your classes? I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but that's the new normal now. For those of you going into practice, you're going to need to be thinking about those kinds of things. What if you disturb that, that biofilm? Legionella kills people, for the record. There's a lot of things that scare us, but Legionella can actually... Uh, and so, in addition to the trillion gallons of water, we are, as a country, beginning a trillion dollar replacement of water systems throughout the U.S. That's for water distribution. I'm not talking about rural and frontier parts of Georgia where people use septic systems or they use well water. I live in rural Maryland. Uh, we're on we're on a public waste wastewater, but I have a well. And you know, I'm off the grid technically. No one will ever come to my house to see what's in that well. People, defos, herbicides, identicides, pesticides. It's up to me as an individual homeowner to test that. In this new era of environmental health, you better get ready to work with and understand and embrace citizen scientists. Folks, they are not going away. They are here to stay. And before you graduate, you should have a plan in your mind of what you're going to do with people who don't have an MPH. They maybe never took a chemistry class or a calculus class. But you know what? They're on Twitter. They're on Facebook, they're on Instagram, and they are getting their message out faster than you are. But for some of our colleagues in health departments, you know what I'm talking about. They are quick. And so how many of you have had a class on how to effectively use Facebook? How to effectively use Instagram? How do you tell your story and get out in front of coronavirus? Do you watch the people in Washington, D.C., or do you pay attention to the local Facebook influencer in your community? We need to think about those things. On the left-hand side of the slide is a, comes, I just took a picture, a snapshot, of a website called IWasPoison.com. Anyone familiar with it? We got a couple folks familiar with it. Anyone in the country or anyone in the world can self-report a foodborne illness on IWasPoison.com. If you think I'm blowing hot air, act, not now during my talk, of course, but <laughs> later, go ahead and Google it and tell me what you find. What I know is this. This, this private stockbroker who got, feels he got sick at a restaurant created this website. He now travels all over the country giving presentations on IWasPoison.com. What is the science background? Not, not. But he's now become an influencer because he was an upset guy with money who created a website. Get ready for it. The second website I want to show you is called Tick Tracker. It's the Lipline program. Uh, this is a program where you can, if you've got a tick on you and you want to identify it or you want to report a tick or report a Lyme disease case, you can go right to this website and, and report that. What federal money was created or, or generated or invested into putting this site together? Not a penny, not a penny, zero dollars. This was literally a Bill Gates story. This website was created in a garage, literally. All the private money. And now, I encourage you, after my talk, of course, to go to that website to kind of look around a little bit. It's actually got some pretty good information. We, Neha, hosted a Lyme disease conference at CDC, right at headquarters, the Roybal uh, campus, on Clifton Road uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago. And these folks were there. They were there because they are players in the public health space. So if you think with your MPH or your PhD or your DRPH or your REHS or your CIH, you are the end all be all, you are mistaken. We need to embrace these people. I'm not saying that they're right, I'm saying that they're real. 
You need to know who the influencers are in your own community when you go out to practice. Emergency preparedness and response is the new normal. Get used to it. If you don't know what ASPER is, then A-S-P-E-R, then you need to look it up. FEMA, how familiar are you with FEMA? CPR, and I'm not talking about heart attacks here. It's the Center for Preparedness and Response at CDC. There's a new director there now, John Dreisner. He was the state health official in Tennessee, a really good guy. Uh, I have a reverse site visit. That's why I'm here in town this week to talk to them and to talk to others about preparedness and response. In a minute, I'll talk about Australia. But we could talk about California. We could talk about flooding in Texas. We could talk about droughts out in the western United States. This is the new normal of weather extremes. Today in Denver, where our home office is, it's 12 degrees and snowing. What is it going to be here today? 70, right? It's the weather is turned up, upside down. And one other thing I think I'd, I'd like to point to you. <coughs> we are active in all of these areas in emergency preparedness and response. We mean environmental health professionals. If you look at a temporary shelter, and there's many of them throughout the U.S. and throughout the world, norovirus will strike. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And guess who are the experts on norovirus? It's you folks. It's me. It's us making recommendations around temporary shelters that are really important. Norovirus is nasty. It's also the leading cause of foodborne illness in the United States. And so this is why people like you need to be involved in emergency preparedness and response. And if I had another hour, I would love just to spend uh, 10 minutes each on each of these segments of, of this presentation. But when there is a disaster, when there is a fire, when there is a flood, we have temporary shelters. We have to feed those folks. Their waste needs to be taken away. Children need to be housed. What are you going to do with pets? In California, when I lived there, and I lived there for 18 years, we had major forest fires in Southern California. You know, the number one surprise of the San Bernardino County Health Department, which is where a lot of these fires were back then, what was the number one surprise when people were evacuated because of the major fires there? Pets. Yeah. Pets. And, and get this, horses. You think LA, it's like this big metropolitan area, it is, but directly to the east of there, there's a lot of horses. A lot of people uh, ride horses and use them for recreation. And human beings were showing up with their horses. What do you do with those? And history is replete with, with these, these kinds of situations. I'm now going to kind of segue into what NEHA is doing as an association. And what my recommendation to you is in terms of trying to bend the arc of the profession to deal with the issues that we face today. First off, we need to get involved upstream in, in policy uh, issues. NEHA has been very active in Washington, D.C. over the last four years advocating for the environmental health profession. One of our touchstone successes is this. Uh, this is the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. It's also referred to as the PAPA legislation, for those of you that are into that thing. It was signed by President Trump in June, and in eight places in the reauthorization language, it says essential practitioners in emergency preparedness and response. You know the usual customers, right? Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and guess what it says next? environmental health professions, and that is your association at work. We are working to embed environmental health professionals in legislation as appropriate. Uh, this photo is yours truly, and this is the CDC uh, environmental health director, Dr. Pat Pricey, who you may know. Uh, we had a hill briefing a couple of months ago talking about PFOA and PFOS in drinking water. And we had hundreds of people in attendance there. These were legislators and their staff on Capitol Hill to hear us talk about approaches to managing and mitigating risks associated uh, with, with uh, this chemical in our drinking water. And it's all over the place. 
virtually everyone in this room has has one of these compounds uh, in, your, in your adipose tissue or in your blood. We need to do a much better job, Professor Stewart, at teaching our students to communicate. And we need to understand that when we use words like high degrees of confidence, anomalies, consequence, exceedingly small, likelihood, and absence, aren't those words you like to use in your reports? Aren't those words you see when students submit? Absolutely. Uh, and they don't work with the general public. No offense to you. They don't work with the general public. I'm a certified industrial hygienist. When my mother passed away, she, I'm convinced she thought I was a dental hygienist, right? <laughs> I just never could explain to her in a way that resonated with her what I did for a living. I think we do this every day to ourselves, and we need to speak the way people, most men in the street and women in the street speak. Do you know what, what, what grade do we, in risk communication, do we try to target for our risk communication techniques? Eighth? Eight. Uh, eight. It's, it's actually fifth grade. Okay. Uh, at APHA, I know for a fact it's fifth grade. Uh, depending on who you, whether it's NIH or CDC, it's fifth or sixth grade level. Have you ever tried to write at the fifth or sixth grade level? It is really hard. There's a software system that will allow you to pull out any uh, any GRE words that you've memorized over time, right? Uh, it, it's difficult, but you need to think about that. We need to be much more effective at telling our story. We need to appeal to people's self-interest. What is it? What's in it for them? And the one thing that I've learned over the last 20 to 30 years is that the way you dress matters. Let me repeat that. The way you dress matters. My criticism of environmental health professionals is they often show up to work in what? Blue jeans and some pullover shirt. Uh, or sneakers, and listen, I'm not suggesting anyone get their clothes dirty if they're out there on the construction site or inspecting retail food, but people treat you the way you dress. In fact, what I know for a fact is most of you judged me before I even said a word to you. You looked at my bow tie and said, what kind of you know, needle-nosed, pin-headed guy is this, is this? Who does he think he is? Or you may have said, oh, he looks like a professor. Or, right, you prejudged me just based on the way I dress. Oh, look, his belt matches his shoes. You think that's, that was random? That is not random. Because I'm not giving you any opportunity to discount me simply because, yeah, by the way, the belt matches his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen by accident. People are judging you all the time. Over 70% of what people think of you has nothing to do with what comes out of your mouth. So when you give a public presentation and you have your slides with your graphs and your Q-tests and your p-values, you are wasting your time if you think that's going to affect anybody. Think about vaccine hesitancy. Why don't more people vaccinate their children? Why? Because there is not enough data? Are you joking me? All the data in the world that you could possibly need to make an informed decision Evidence-based public health, right? I know Dr. Stephen talks about that. I know your other professors talk about that. How does that evidence-based public health influence people that refuse to vaccinate their children? And most of these vaccine-hesitant people have master's and doctoral degrees, are well-educated, and doing what we know this. So these are folks that ostensibly should know better. So data is important. It's important for policies. I am not poo-pooing science, I'm not poo-pooing data, but you better believe that people, citizen scientists, who don't have the data and the, the science knowledge that you have, they're gonna spin circles around you whether you like it or not, unless you understand the game that they're in. And if you don't dress professionally, I don't, and I don't, I don't mean you have to spend a, a ton on your wardrobe, but people are judging you whether you like, just like you've judged me, and it's subconscious. Because most of you say, oh, that's not true. I wouldn't judge you. Right? Is that what you're saying to yourself? You judge me because you're human. Now, don't lose that. I'm not suggesting that you're But that's, that's what's important. Uh, Ten minutes. We should just... okay, Ten should... minutes? So I have like 45 minutes worth of stuff to go through. <laughs> uh, so let, let me kind of 
move quickly. We are publishing, and you need to publish. For those young folks moving into your careers, even if you go into practice, publish. And if I had 45 more minutes, I would convey to you why that's, that's so critical. It is your legacy is what you leave in the public record. And yes, it's one, one extra step, but I encourage you to, to embrace that. Data, data, you need to treat it like water. It's asymmetrical, it's dynamic, it's continuous. If you go onto the website uh, around coronavirus, you will find as much data that is not controlled by CDC or NIH or ASPR or FEMA as you will coming out of those camps. We need to be able to embrace that, understand it, and to be able to uh, to combat that publicly and politely and diplomatically uh, over time. We need to tell our story. And I was sharing with Dr. Stewart earlier, I believe we're about to get a major grant to be involved in environmental health storytelling for the next five years. Okay? This is really important. And it's got to resonate with policymakers. It has to resonate uh, with local decision makers. Uh, and I've published, by the way, threading these things together. I did an ABC News interview by computer last week, by Zoom, which is really fun. Uh, on pets and retail food outlets. Is it safe to bring your dog or any dog into a retail food? We don't, sir, I need an hour and 45 minutes and we could get into, we could get into that. This whole issue with, with the changing world around us, uh, this is a picture I took on November 10th and 11th. On the left, this is in Sydney, Australia. I keynoted the Environmental Health Australia meeting. On the left, what you can see is the very famous opera house. Look at the blue sky. On the right is the next day. I took these pictures. These are mine. And those aren't clouds. That is smoke from wildfires, from bushfires. And the people walking around with dust masks, whether it was appropriate or, or, or not, it, it was unbelievable. I have some pictures from an airplane if anyone would like to see it. We need to spend a lot more time on, on forest fires and then around emerging issues. You may want to take a picture of this, or I'll share this, this PowerPoint presentation. Tire crumbs, you see them, these are shredded tire bits. Remember this conversation. Remember this conversation. Tire crumbs are going to be a reading assignment for you next year, for those of you that are still in school. What's in those things? We put them in playgrounds, can you believe that? Right, because it's a soft landing. There's some cancers showing up in soccer goalies that we think are related to tire crumbs because they catch the ball and that dust goes in their face. Mm -hmm. Cannabis. Uh, I live and work, or I have I work in Colorado, I have a flat there. I walk by three dispensaries on the way to the office in China. Legalized cannabis is just too much money there for states to ignore it forever. I don't know about Georgia, probably not legalizing cannabis soon, but as soon as you see the elected officials see how much money is involved, they'll be on it. And then 5G. Stay tuned for all these 5G antennas going on. Uh, going out all across the country. Do me a favor. Look at the IARC, uh, the International Association of uh, is it, uh, Cancers, right? IARC. They've already identified this as a suspect carcinogen, and we're putting up something like 5,000 new antennas in this country over the next several years. And where where are they going to end up being installed? Playground. I mean, just watch, watch, because there's all that open space. Stay tuned for this. Remember, you heard it here first. You can say, hey, that guy, that guy with the bow tie told me about this. Okay. For those of you that think environmental health is not critical, it's the second largest part of the workforce. This comes from NATO, not from me. Registered nurses are the largest part. Environmental health is the second largest part up there at the top right. 10% of the workforce is, is EH. For those of you that think, oh, this profession, we're aging out. Uh, we took a random sample of 1,000 of our members. Most of our members are aged 25 to 39. This profession is young, and it's, it, yes, there's some old guys like me in it, but we're aging out. It is your time to, to get involved and to provide leadership. And by the way, it's young people and young women that are rapidly ascending into leadership uh, positions. Our membership, by the way, has grown over 60% in the last three to four years. Well, we're delighted by that growth, and uh, I'm not sure I know how to explain it, but this is really important. This profession has got legs, and don't let anybody tell you uh, otherwise. And this is where, John, where I'd like to, to kind of close out a bit. 
For you early professionals, you folks that are about to graduate or have recently graduated, go where things are going. If you're asked to work on opioids, do it. If you're asked to work on 5G in your community, do it. Establish your name as a person that can provide solutions, even if it isn't directly threaded to what you studied in school. Experiment relentlessly. Try to find work or work for yourself where you can try different things. For staff that report to me, I ask them what they failed in each month. Because if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough, and we're not innovating if we're not taking risks in the workplace. For mid-career people, you need to learn and relearn and relearn and relearn. I, got, I started this presentation by talking about being committed to uh, being evergreen with, with your career. Once you learn SPSS or SAS or whatever the software system is, trust me, after you graduate, there's going to be a new version of that. You're going to have to relearn it. Just get used to it and do it. Avoid the temptation to regress into a BMW. Am I talking about a German engineered vehicle? Am I? I'm talking about people who bitch and moan and whine about their okay? Do not fall victim to that. And it's really easy for folks that say, hey, I, I've got my system down. I've got my system down. Don't bug me. Yeah, they need, they need to be disturbed and they might turn into a BMW. Don't let that happen to you. For people that consider themselves leaders, your job is to take us from what we know into a future that we don't know. If somebody can tell me what climate change is, the effects in Georgia will be two years from now, uh, I'm all ears. But nobody in this room knows. And as a leader, we need to prepare ourselves uh, for that. Communicate a new vision for public health. I think I've done that. I've talked about the new era in public health. Just collecting data and reporting it, we need to translate that data into knowledge. And rarely, rarely do I ever see any wisdom coming out of the data that we have. It's always like, oh, this is what the data told us. I'm like, wait a second. So what are you going to do with that? It's not the what, it's the so what. So what you have this. So what policies will you implement? And then for leaders, seek growth and performance, impact, and creativity of all of your staff. Last week, I started a new practice at EHA. We have a Monday morning leadership phone call, and I've started to invite twice now the receptions for EHA, along with the leaders that have million dollar portfolios. And I've learned more in the last two weeks from that receptions about what our members are struggling with and the kinds of challenges that they face in doing business with us. I, I'm embarrassed I didn't do this five years ago. But at least we've got, got it done now, and everybody can contribute. For everybody, remain agile. Ask yourselves when you go out to do your work, how are we seen by those who might work with us? And then finally, be yourself. The world worships originality. Don't try to be me. Don't try to be Dr. Stewart. Don't try to be somebody else. Be the best version of yourself. It may sound cliche, but I, I genuinely mean it. Be yourself. Don't rob me of you. If there's not another you, please just be the best version of it. I'd like to close by, by sharing with you uh, the end of the story of uh, Robert and Alice Polycott. <coughs> they stayed in London because they were committed to their community, just like your community, too. To, to your community. They felt like uh, running a grocery store and providing a meal for people uh, not far from Waterloo Station was an important part of their commitment to London, commitment to the country, and, and frankly, it, it validated uh, their self-worth for, for that environment. They sent their children, Cynthia and Kathy, off to Colchester with strangers. Chester is like 130 kilometers to, to the northeast of London, where those two children uh, spent the war. Uh, Kathy and Cynthia uh, were my aunt and my mother. And I get to call with this. Uh, they're all gone now, and I miss them uh, dramatically. It's, it's, it's horrific that they're no longer with us. But it is that part of my family. It's the roots. It's the history. And that grocery store.
in London, not far from Waterloo Station, that probably gave rise to why I'm here today. And I thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, for having me here today. Appreciate it. So we have a few minutes for questions. I sure hope we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you have another minute, we understand, but please uh, let's take advantage of the opportunity to digest here to ask any questions. Hi. Um, so I wonder if you could help us. I'm a faculty member, and recently the Council on Education for Public Health has really, I would say, underemphasized the role of environmental health and the, uh, the sort of competencies that they require us to support. And I wonder if you could reflect on that and, and what you think that as environmental health faculty. Um, how we sort of revitalize or reinvigorate that confronting this sort of shift. I don't know if that's. Yeah, that's a fair question, and I'm going to repeat it for people back uh, who are watching from video. The question has to do with the new C criteria and the apparent disemphasis on environmental health competencies. Uh, as you know, there are some of the core competencies that remain that are environmentally oriented. There's like eight or nine of them that, that remain that way. But this is a, a fairly consistent sentiment from environmental health faculty from across the country, and frankly, for the seek accredited programs in other parts of, of the world. And there are other countries that, that are represented. Uh, we had a session on this at the NEHA conference uh, last year, and uh, there was a lot of animated conversation about that. I believe that we need to go to the seat board collectively and communicate our concern, but it has to be framed as an advocacy for uh, the preparation of students and not just self-protection of, of the discipline. Uh, there have been many other professions that have approached me from the clinical side of the house in the, in the United States that have asked NEHA to join them, perhaps going to the seat board uh, to, to discuss that. The current seat president, or the incoming seat president, was uh, the dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Georgia. I believe this presents us with an opportune time to, to uh, sit down with, uh, with the current uh, chair of that group and to talk about our concerns in a meaningful way. Uh, those changes to the criteria happen intermittently. I think every five years or so, I think that they may be entertained. I don't have that number committed to memory. But I think when the next cycle comes up, all of us collectively should be prepared for that. Not at the last minute, but we should be talking about it about it now. There's just been a handful of schools, two or three, that have dropped their environmental health program altogether. And I'm sad to report to you that it was my, uh, where I taught for 18 years, Loma Linda was one of the first uh, that dropped that program after my departure. So all of us in environmental health need to make sure that it's not just us as leaders, that are leading uh, these departments, but that there's a collective support for it. I met with your dean just before coming here, and, and I felt the support for EH for environmental health from him. But we can never take that for granted. And uh, we have to live with this current cycle, but when the new cycle comes up for review, we should have a strong and compelling case why this needs to be revisited. And? Um. I watched a presentation recently by an environmental engineering professor who's the president of their organization basically saying, if you look at what we're teaching students, our profession is not keeping up with the way it should be changing. Um, do you think that we are? Do you think we're really, in terms of what we teach students and everything, keeping up with where the field is going? Yeah, thank you. So the question was, are we keeping up, and I think we is the uppercase W, right? It's all of us. Are we keeping up with uh, training students with what they need to know for the emerging challenges that they'll face as, as graduates? And I, I think we just need to be realistic. Professors are rewarded based on research and publications, by and large. Not completely, but, but by and large. I think that there needs to be a very strong and energetic presence of practitioners that in part, what's happening in the real world where the rubber meets the road in every academic program. I think that there can be a balance of theory and research, but like with our colleagues in the back row who are vitally critical to the education of every undergraduate and graduate student, 
They even say, here's the theory, and this is how it works in practice. I think that thread needs to be present. The fact that you've got three practitioners in the back row speaks volumes. I mean, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by, by that. You should feel blessed to have their presence here. Because if all of us together, this needs to be a profession-wide initiative and not just an academic initiative. And I think uh, institutions that bring practitioners from the field, and by the way, bring those citizen scientists into the classroom, not to teach, but to share their story. I think it's really important so that because it's the public and public health that we often forget in our education. It's about the science of public health, which is really important. But that's just a piece. So continue to do what you're doing, but be sure that where the rubber meets the road or the translational research is being conducted, that that translation piece isn't lost in the rush to publish. I didn't answer your question. Or? Yes, you did. Sir, I'm not going to ask you to comment on the current administration's view on environment. I'm just, we don't need to go there. We all know where that is. But what I want to know is from your interactions with folks in Washington, is there still enough support so when we get through this period, we will get back to really caring about the environment and the environment's impact on people? I'm, the question is, if there's a new administration elected in whenever it is, whenever that is, uh, will we, are we, do we remain committed to the environment? And are, is the profession ready to move forward in the event that that happens? The answer is, is a resounding yes. There are professionals all across the country that are pre-poised, that are prepared to dig in to protect and promote the health, safety, and security of every resident of this country, whether they're a citizen or, or not. I know them on a first name basis, many of them. Uh, they want to do the right thing by everyone in this room. They are parents, they are children, uh, they are siblings, and there's a lot of committed professionals that are ready to get to work right away, right away, to steal Doc, uh, President Obama's mind, right away, uh, to, to get back and to protect and promote the health of the nation. So I'm confident 100% confident that those people are, are ready to go. Uh, with each change of administration, it, it's like a boat at sea. It takes a while to, to uh, reposition it. But uh, I'm convinced that those people, and a lot of them right here in this city, that still continue to do great work in protecting and promoting the health of the nation. So it's, it's, uh, it's a challenging time, but I think we're going to get through it. Let's learn what's happening now. Uh, let's make sure that we share those lessons learned and come out stronger on the back end. And I genuinely mean what I just said. If I could just add to that, this isn't the first time that environmental <coughs> health and public health in general has gone through kind of a dark time on the national level in terms of, you know, the attack on our, on our basic laws and so forth. We went through it um, uh, in the Reagan years and uh, uh, to some lesser extent in the uh, President George uh, W. Bush years. So uh, uh, things things do cycle through, and the basic, I think the important thing is the basic needs never go away. And your original point that you started with about what's on the news every day, every news, coronavirus, and, you know, the, the, it's obvious that the public health needs have gone away, and making the case that that's an environmental health problem is is extremely important so we we need to take advantage of teachable moments one of my criticisms of my profession and public health in general is we do these things called hot washes hot washes are exercises where we reflect on what just happened and what we learned and we just beat the crap out of each other about what went down <coughs> how many people died from ebola during the most recent pandemic in the United States, who, who caught the disease in the United States, who contracted it? Zero. And all we did was beat each other up about how we could have done this faster or this better. We need to, we need to relax a little bit. And we need to celebrate more often in a meaningful way, not beating our chest, not gloating, but in a very humble way. We do some great things and we never tell anybody. 
And then we're surprised when people don't know who we are. This is why I'm so excited if we get this investment on storytelling. I'm going to come looking for you. Tell me your story. Tell me what's happening in communities all across this nation. Environmental health is profoundly local. It is profoundly local. It's not what happens in Washington, D.C. It's what happens in Decatur. It's what happens in DeKalb County. It's what happens in Atlanta. It's what happens in Athens. That's where environmental health plays out. And we need to dig down and tell those stories, man. I have a related question to that because I'm thinking about, um, so about getting involved in the policy makers and then telling different stories. So in terms of why I do my research and my work in environmental health, I come from a certain place, but this policy maker may only be interested in how many dollars it cents. So do we also need to kind of speak to the people what's important to them as long as it's part of a larger picture and not mission how it's very important to just have people alive and have people be healthy and whatnot, but say this is going to save money, these people will be so, so the question is, is the strategy around working with policymakers, uh, do we focus on the, the return on investment or the, the monetary benefits to, to that? I, I don't think it's an either or game. You use the right tool at the right moment. If it's a story, the children are tell very powerful stories, just, just their picture and the story of a child or the story of a family is, is very powerful. But if you've got someone who's interested in the, the monetization of public health, I think we as a profession need to do a better job of, of that. If you give me a dollar to inspect restaurants, what can you expect in, in return? I had this conversation with the National Food and Drug Administration last week, and I think we'd like to, to get our arms around that. Uh, we do it in medicine all the time. It's called comparative uh, uh, analysis, where risk analysis, where you compare one procedure and its cost against another procedure and its cost. We don't really do that in public health. We do some, but we don't do it as much as we could uh, because we're always looking for absolute answers. But medicine says, hey, screw the absolute. We'll just compare different approaches. Well, we could, we could learn uh, from, from them. But I, I think we, we need to be human beings first. We need to come across as parents, as children, as members of our communities. And it's those heuristics or affect, the, the emotional state that somebody's in when they decide that they're not going to vaccinate their ch children. When somebody is emotionally uh, activated, that's when we need to approach them. We start with a human story, and then I think the money and, and the, uh, the data need to be threaded right, right to that. But we, we in public health aren't very good at being public. We're very good at being scientists. And I think we, we if I had to go back into academia, I would, I would reorient the way that I teach my courses so that we always talk about the human dimension of everything that we do. Even my son's a biostat major, Hopkins. I'm like, don't forget what this, what this day is. Day is all people, right? Because he's all talking about this and that. And I'm like, dude, 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 these are humans. These are humans. Don't forget what this is about. Uh, my boss is here, and she wants to ask a question, and I better let her ask that before we close out. That's, I, I, that's I get into trouble. <laughs> Priscilla Oliver is the president of, of NEHOP, and I don't know how we're doing for time. We we're probably going to have to wrap it up after Dr. Oliver. So. First of all, I am a Georgia State Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you, uh, Dr. Dijak, to talk a little bit about our upcoming conference in New York and how we might effectively get some students and faculty. And uh, anybody else that might want to come? So we, our annual conference is in Times Square, New York. It's the second week of July. Uh, we have top tier speakers, including Dr. Reverend Durley from Atlanta, Georgia. We have Dr. George Benjamin, the APHA Executive Director is the keynote. And Dr. John Howard, the NIOSH Director, will be kicking off a plenary session uh, educational uh, program. <coughs> it is a great location. You don't need a car, you don't need to take a taxi, uh, you just need to get yourself to Times Square, New York, uh, in any way that that's, that's possible. Uh, we, there are some scholarships for the conference available through some of our, our partners. We try to treat, or we do treat students uh, 
with the respect that they deserve. Anyone that registers for the conference gets full conference benefits, just like any other professional that, that attends. Uh, we have special programs for students, and we really are doing everything we can to ensure that you get calibrated uh, to the profession and that you get to meet as many influencers as you want to meet as, as part of that process. Uh, whether you're in environmental health or public health or some other rubric within the greater health professions, <coughs> these conferences are wonderful places to meet people who can help advance your career. That can give you an introduction to an agency that you'd like to uh, possibly work at, to get advice on starting your own business, uh, to learning about what's on the credentialing exam. And so I highly encourage you to attend. Actually, I highly encourage you to join me. Uh, it's $25 a year. And the return on investment is, is $16.50 for each $1 in the membership. Okay. So we, we attract $16.50 of additional resources for every $1 that we get uh, from from Nihon membership. So our budget is 5% from members and 95% from grants and contracts and other services that, that, that we provide. We desperately will be looking to hire folks that want to work in Environmental Health or National Association uh, here over the next several months. Keep your eye out for our website. Please apply. Uh, we're hiring really in two places, Washington, D.C. and Denver. And the climates are different, the cultures are different, the coasts are different. Pick your poison and go, right? I'm serious. We'd love to have someone from this program uh, work at our association, and we are, our budget has doubled in the last three years. Uh, it's incredible how much growth we've gone through. Please be part of the solution. Uh, and dust off the passport uh, because there's lots of work uh, that we need to And uh, Professor Stewart, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for the uh, interesting and inspirational talk. Very quickly, um, uh, before you go, we passed around attendance lists, and so if you just leave those on the table, we'll pick it up uh, afterwards. Um, there is uh, pizza remaining, and if you guys don't take it with you, we'll have to give it to faculty, okay? So <laughs> take as much as you can. Uh, and finally, let me say thank you for being such an engaged audience. Give yourself a round of applause. Thank you for the uh, uh, professionals from the Georgia Department of Public Health for walking down uh, the Gator Street. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Oliver, I'm so glad you uh, introduced yourself. But uh, Priscilla is a true VIP in, in many ways, including a uh, very impressive president of MIHA. So uh, we're, and we're proud that you're a panther to Priscilla. Uh, and next to uh, Dr. Oliver is Dr. Yomi Noemi, who's the Executive Director of EcoAction, one of our key partners here in the community that does great work in communities and addressing their environmental health problems. So Dr. Yomi. <laughs>